If your greatest grief is a ball game, you're, you're doing all right today. I'm going to be able to leave you better than, than, than we found you. Um, I don't think any of us played in it, did we? Okay. Uh, did anybody go to the game? No? Well, see, you even saved your, your drive and money doing that. But I say that to bring this to this light. Whether you uh, are a Carolina fan, a Clemson fan, a Georgia fan, a Florida fan, and everything in between, it doesn't matter who you are and where you're from and what age you are, you understand that this life is full of grace. And today, especially during this holiday season, this is just something God has brought me to um, year after year after year. And I mean, in fact, this was the first time that I just went, okay, God, I know that you want me to, to deal with this uh, animal. It's a wild animal called grief uh, right between Thanksgiving and, and Christmas. And let me tell you this. Here, here's what I um, uh, try to do with anything that I preach to you. Um, I like God to refresh me on it. You know, I don't like to go to God and say, well, hey, you know what, here's what I'm going to say because I said this before, I said that before. So I went, I went to God, I said, God, I want you to give me a fresh wind, fresh fire on all that you've taught me now and all that you could reveal to me now on this subject called grief. Today's message is simply entitled, Another Holiday Without Them. Now, you may be walking in here with um, um, many, many different types of griefs, Okay. And I would tell you this message, the very principles that, that I will share, can help you no matter what your grief. But the lens through which we're going to go to today that I think everybody can identify with is, is the, the, the truth of God's Word and the help from God's Word that we need when we're dealing with the loss of a loved one. When someone used to be living here on earth with us, but they're no longer living here with us uh, now. Um, I want you to write this down, that if you don't deal with your grief your grief will deal with you, okay? It's like when people think, well, hey, you know what? I won't seek to let faith lead me in the new year. If you don't seek to let faith lead you in the new year, your flesh will lead you, okay? And the same thing about grief. You can say, well, hey, I just don't want to talk about it. I don't want to think about it. Um, I don't want to process it. Well, let me help you understand. When's the last time you had something heavy in your heart that you chose to, you wanted to feel heavy about? It? You didn't choose it. It chooses you. We're going to talk about grief when it comes to losing a loved one. I just recently wrote in my own prayer journal these words uh, just a couple weeks ago. I said, Lord, you know this is my second year of my dad not being here on his birthday, the second year of, of dad not being here for Thanksgiving. It'll be the second year that he's not been here for, for Christmas. Uh, my mom and my dad, their birthdays are like 14 days apart. Uh, so we'll celebrate my mom's birthday this Tuesday night, and, and, and this is just the second time that she's had to celebrate that without him. And any of you who've ever lost a loved one, you know that grief is a part of things that follow. doesn't matter whether you're, you're, you're the pastor or the president. Grief is a part of life. I want us to look at how to deal with that in a way that I think will leave you... Um, out of here better than you came in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, open our eyes that we might see what you want us to see. Open our ears that we might uh, hear what you want us to hear, Lord, and open our hearts that we might receive what it is you want us to receive, Lord, uh, not only inform us, but transform us. In Jesus' name, amen. The first thing I want you to see about um, uh, grief is this. Number one, the longer we live, the more we will grieve. The longer we live, the more we will grieve. This isn't something I had to read in a book and learn. Uh, I and, and yourself, we learn this through life. Listen, not only is this world temporary, we're temporary. Okay? There is no such thing as a permanent relationship unless you're talking about Jesus Christ. There is no such thing. Everything that we have in life, every person that we have in life is subject to change. Our souls were made for eternity, but this life is, is temporary. And therefore, throughout this life, uh, the longer we live, the more griefs we will have. Why? Because the longer you live, the more earthly goodbyes you will have. I've talked with many a person that was in their 90s plus, and, and many of those people, they reach a point to where they, they've lost every single family member they know. 
Okay, I've, I've seen even people that outlived all their kids. You know, that's, that may be rare, but, but, but sometimes that even happens. But the longer we live, the more we're going to be saying goodbye to people in our lives. And, and the reason that gets so deep is this, is, is I find whenever I have helped people through grief that, that when you lose the people that were the people who knew the most about you and who understood the most about you, and who were there to know what you went through, or what you're going through, um, that is deep relationship, isn't it? That is deep relationship. Jesus says in John 16, Jesus said, here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. You might as well say you'll have many griefs. Now, what is grief? I'm going to give you some key words. They're not up on the screen. Put this over to the side somewhere. What is grief? Two words, deep sorrow. Deep sorrow, especially that caused by someone's death. If you look it up in the dictionary, that's exactly what it says. Deep sorrow, especially that which is caused by someone's death. Because how many of we know, we know that death is permanent. Henry Longfellow says this. He says, every man has his secret sorrows, which the world knows not. And oftentimes, we call a man cold when he is only sad. Now, I have a theory that I live by with people, and that's this. You show me the person that seems the most bitter. You show me the person that's throwing out the most mouth vomit. You show me the person who seems the most disturbing to others, and I'll show you the person who's most disturbed and grieve within. You need not think sometimes that people are mad when sometimes they're really sad. They're really sad. And, and, and listen, I, 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 try to, I try not to tell people how they should do with people, but I want you to hear me on something. Do you know something that believers need to learn a little bit better? And that is how to not just hit people over the head with the King James Bible and not know how to love people right where they're at. Because listen, when a person is deeply grieving, the last thing they need is someone to just tell them that they don't have their act together. They need somebody to love them first. Listen, Jesus loved you first. Praise God. Don't you, aren't you grateful of that? He loved you first. He gave you grace. He gives you grace. That's the way we're to love other people. Recognize that whether they're family, friends, coworkers, classmates, whatever, that, that pay attention to what people are dealing with. Because listen, if it matters to them, it matters. Doesn't mean they're chasing Christ. It doesn't mean that they are, are trying to do things God's way. You, listen, here at Refuge Church, you know how we try to change the way people think about church? We try to love them, no strings attached, period. That's all. That's the best I can tell you we got to bring to you, is we're trying to love you no matter what. We want you to understand when you walk in here, we don't care what other people say about you, what other people feel like you've done or not done. We love you right where you are. We, listen, you don't have to like what someone does to love somebody. And that, that's free. That wasn't even part of this message. Grief, it is, it is deep sorrow. It's also this, put this down, part of life. Grief is part of life. Billy Graham said the Christian life is not a constant high. He said, I have my moments of deep discouragement. I have to go to God in prayer with tears in my eyes and say, oh, God, forgive me, or oh, God, help me. That's Billy Graham. Now, listen, there ain't too many people that were a man of God like Billy Graham. Billy Graham was as close as a human being could to what would God. At the same time, he still needed God. Amen? But also, you need to know this. Grief is life-changing. This is why we're having to deal with this. Grief is life-changing. Ross and Kessler say, you will not get over the loss of a loved one. You will learn to live with it. You will heal and you will rebuild yourself around the loss you have suffered. You will be whole again, but you will never be the same, nor should you be the same, nor should you want to. And Rafi once said, said, grief has two parts. Here's the two parts. The first part is loss, and the second is the remaking of your life. See, there was the old normal. Hey, it used to be this way when that person was here. Okay? Grandma used to make the dumplings. Granddaddy used to make the steaks, whatever. You, 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 we start, listen, once we have life a certain way, we all are creatures of a habit and don't like change. And so we, we see this major change and we go, man, God, how am I supposed to live without that person? They were such a, a main part of my life. You have to trust God with the loss and look to God to help you find your new normal. 
without losing your way. Because listen, if you lose your way, I'm going to see you at the bar. And you'll be drinking the most. And just so you know, that you can measure things even by that way. Listen, don't, don't fault somebody for, for guzzling something, taking something. They're just trying to drown out their pain. That's all they're trying to do, okay? When you don't have, a, when you don't have peace elsewhere, you've got to find peace somewhere. And even though and anything else and anyone else, all they can do is maybe numb the pain for a short while. You still got to wake back up to it later. Jesus can help you through the pain. And that's what we want to look to. And that brings me to number two. The greater our love, the deeper our grief. The greater our love, the deeper our grief. During my time as a bereavement uh, counselor in hospice, I, I learned by tracking people's grief and following up with many a person for at least 13 months after, after their loved one's passing, I started seeing a common ground that I didn't even know what I was seeing. But I, I came up with this theory, and I was like, okay, the closer the, the, the relationship, the deeper the grief. Okay? The more attachments to a person, the deeper the grief. Let me explain what I mean by that. If that person was someone I talked to every single day, that's going to be deep grief because it's triggered every day, right? Because now I can't talk with them every day. If that person is an immediate family member, it's going to be deep, whether they lived in your house or not. If that person was someone that you saw all the time, you're going to miss them now. You're going, hey, I miss them all. All the time. Why? Because you're used to seeing them all the time. And that's why, that's why people grieve sometimes at holidays that they don't grieve other times. Because even if you didn't have that level of attachment to a loved one, but you always saw them on Thanksgiving or you always saw them on, on, on Christmas Day or what have you, it just is, listen, it takes a while to get used to a new normal. Amen? Chaplain Robert Orr, he wrote this. I don't have it on the screen. He wrote this grief poem. He said, listen to it closely. He says, grief is the last act of love we give to our loved one. Where there is deep grief, there is great love. He goes on to say, and with the pain can come gratitude of the gift of time we had, the love that was shared, and the power to become a better person because they loved us. I want you to look at, at, at something maybe you've missed before in Scripture. I know I have, and, and that was God showed me this week. He was like, listen, Jesus knows what it's like to have deep grief over someone that he's close with that passes from this life to the next. John 11. I'm going to read selected Scriptures out of John chapter 11, verses 1 and, and following. It says, now a certain man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village where Mary and her, and her sister Martha lived. So the sisters sent word to Jesus saying, listen to what it says, Lord, he, our brother, your friend, whom you love, is sick. This wasn't just anybody. This wasn't some stranger to Jesus. It's like a brother. Verse 4 says, when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness will not end death. But on the contrary, it is for the glory and honor of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. By the way, every loss, every pain that we deal with, God has a purpose for it. And his purpose is not to harm us, but to give us a hope and a future. His purpose is not to, to steal our life, but hopefully maybe even um, infuse us with living with a greater sense of urgency. Verse 5 says, Now Jesus loved and was concerned about Martha and her sister and Lazarus and considered them dear friends. Verse 17 says, when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet with him while Mary remained sitting in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. What do we normally think when someone passes? God, where were you? God, why did you allow this to happen? God, why didn't you act sooner? Why didn't you show us the cancer sooner? Why didn't you show us the heart issues sooner? Why didn't you rescue that person? Because I'm not ready to, to let go of them. And they weren't ready to let go. Verse 32 says, When Mary came to the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her sobbing, it's deep grief, and the Jews who had come with her also sobbing, he was deeply moved in spirit to the point of anger at the sorrow caused by death. 
and was troubled. By the way, anger is a part of deep grief. Okay? It, it, it's just as much as is denial. He goes on to say and, 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 and said, where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come and see. And look what Jesus did. Jesus what? Wept. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him as a close friend. Listen, it's perfectly normal when you lose a very dear loved one, when you lose someone that shared a piece of your heart for whatever reason, even if you didn't even feel like you talked to that person much at all, you don't even feel like you had a very, very deep relationship, but you had a deep connection. It is very, very normal to have deep grief. In fact, the people I worry about most when someone says, well, hey, I had a real deep relationship with so-and-so, I worry most about people who don't cry than I worry about people who do cry. Because who you think made the tears? See, see God made the tears, and, and, and those things, somehow they cleanse us. They cleanse us. When we cry and tears are necessary, I want you to hear me. Don't ever tell anybody, ever tell anybody, suck it up, buttercup. You know, I, let, me, let me just rephrase that. Don't let me hear you telling someone who's in the deepest piece of grief, well, you just got to get over that. And you just, that's the person I'm going to tell you, you just need to not hang out with them. Okay? Because you can't be in deep grief and have everybody in your life at the same time. It's not possible because, listen, we're, we're more touchy. But I want you to understand, God made the tears, and he wants to cleanse your heart through the tears. Don't be afraid to cry and find people. Listen, that's, that's a good slogan right out there. Find friends who will let you cry and love you regardless of why you're crying for or how long you cry. But thirdly, only in Jesus can we find true peace healing, and hope. Only in Jesus can we find true peace, healing, and hope. Something God gave me, I want you to write it down. Our grief does not come from God. Our grief does not come from God. It comes from a fallen, sinful, imperfect world that that sin birthed. And this is why we needed a perfect Savior sent, sent from heaven down to earth to die for our sins, to give us both hope in this life and hope in the life to come. But understand this, our grief does not come from God. It does reveal our need for God. If you didn't know you needed him before, let God take from you things that he had provided for you, and you will quickly realize, hey, I can't even walk without him holding my hand. John 16, we looked at part of the scripture earlier. John 16, Jesus said, you may have peace in me. If you search the scripture from Genesis to Revelation, you will find that not one thing that God's created can bring you peace or that this world's created can give you lasting peace apart from Jesus. So Jesus says, in me, you can have peace. But here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart because I have overcome the world. You don't need to ask yourself whether you're going to face trials and sorrows. You need to go ahead and ask God how you're going to deal with it. Because you can't avoid them. You cannot avoid them. I remember uh, reading from an author author, um, some years back, and and he, he was talking about the fact, he said, no matter how much we fight for a perfect world and a perfect life, uh, inevitably, something's going to come along that tears that down. Do you hear me? Something's going to come along. You know, I always say, God, please brace me, prepare me so that I'm not just totally thrown out to the wind. You know, I think we all know what it's like that if we think about something and we what if something too much, it can take us to a very, very fearful place. Okay? But listen to this. Psalm 147 verse 3 says, He heals the brokenhearted, and he binds up their wounds, healing their pain and comforting their sorrow. The reason the scriptures say we got to trust God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength is because any other place or any other person that we're leaning on is bound to disappoint us. And they don't even have to be wanting to. I want you to hear this, though. In Christ, you can have the greatest comfort. In Christ, you can have the greatest peace. And in Christ, even though there's many things you don't get over, 
God can take you through. Where you are right now doesn't have to be where you are tomorrow. And there's one thing you have to be willing to do, and that is you have to be willing to take the next right step. Because if you sit home, as many people that I know are doing this right now, even as I preach, if you sit home and just let the walls close in on you, things will get darker and darker and darker and darker. You got sometimes listen, you got to take that next right step and you got to trust God and what he's promised that he would do for you. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, it says, Now, we do not want you to be uninformed believers about those who are asleep in death so that you will not grieve for them as the others do who have no hope beyond this present life. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, as in fact he did, even so God in this same way, by raising them from the dead, will bring with him those believers who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For we say this to you by the Lord's own word. So encourage each other with these words. I want to encourage you with what Jesus said. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my house are many mansions, many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you so. And he says, I'm going there to prepare a place for you, those of you who are believers in Jesus Christ, so that where I am, you can be also. They said, well, well, how's the way? What's the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I want you to hear me. If all you have is Jesus and nothing else, you have everything you need most. you got to have Jesus. How, how can you make it through the deepest griefs without the greatest hope? Jesus kept telling Mary and Martha, even though they were in their frantic state, he keeps trying to tell them, Stuff like this, John 11, 25 through 27. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in, in and adheres to, trusts in, relies on me as Savior will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me as Savior will never die. Do you believe this? Martha and Mary went on to say, hey, I believe it. I believe it. But right now I'm hurting. I'm hurting. Listen, when it comes to those in heaven, I want you to write this down. When it comes to those in heaven, those who have died in Christ and those who have now crossed from death to eternity, I want you to hear this part right here. They are in heaven forever. I want you to write that down. They're in heaven forever. They are no longer suffering, and you can see them again. I want you to hear it again. They are in heaven forever. They are no longer suffering and you can see them again. I want you to hear me when I say this to you. When it comes to your loved one who've passed in this life and knew Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord, you are not crying for them. You are crying because of them. You are not grieving for you. You are grieving because you love them so much. Listen, they're in a perfect place. They're better than you. They are at whole. They are happy. And in Christ, listen, you can even look forward to the holy reunion. Listen, praise God, our grief is only temporary if we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. But number four, even with Jesus, we need to grieve and be comforted. I want you to hear me clearly. Even with Jesus, we need to grieve and be comforted. You need to know it's okay to grieve. I want you to write this down. You have permission to grieve. As I told you, I really believe this is how most of us feel. If somebody can't love me where I'm at in my deepest grief in that season, they're not going to be able to love me, okay? Because, see, when I'm in my deepest grief, I'm not at, I'm not at my greatest strength, am I? I'm in a very vulnerable, vulnerable state. Listen, if it's not okay to cry and grieve, then why did Jesus weep in front of other people? Jesus wept. He showed us it's okay to cry. In fact, I'm going to have to come up with that slogan. Somebody get the t-shirt ready. Real men cry daily. Man, I'm a real man now. Matthew 5, 4, Jesus says, God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. He didn't get mad at you because you're grieving. His heart breaks. Ecclesiastes 3, 4 says, there's a time to cry and a, and a time to laugh and a time to grieve and a time to dance. By the way, that's why Revelation 21.4, even though I don't have that scripture down, write it down, Revelation 21.4, gives us the greatest depiction of heaven where Jesus, where God's word says, hey, you know what? In heaven, 
There will be no more pain, no more tears, no more heartache, no more sorrow. For the old order of things have gone away. Behold, all things become new. Listen, it won't be like this forever. Satan wants you to be convinced that it is. Listen, Jesus even wept in front of people. And God comforted him. 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4 through 4 says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father. Listen to this part. He is the source of all comfort. He comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort others when they are troubled. We will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. Now, I want to stop right there and I want to tell you something that you don't realize that your pain has given you. It has given you opportunity. Once you understand a certain pain, you have an obligation, you have an opportunity to let God use that pain to help someone else. Until I lost my dad, I didn't know what it was like to lose a dad. Listen, you, don't, you can't identify with someone until you've experienced something similar. How many of you, you've experienced something and it helped you have compassion towards somebody else that before you wouldn't have had? Listen, if I run into somebody with chronic pain or chronic illness, my wife will tell you, it wouldn't matter whether we're in the mall, we at McDonald's, or we're out here on the streets or we're in the church. I'm going to be glued to you going, hey, I know what it's like to be in crippling pain. I know what it's like to feel like you can't get any better. I know what it's like to really, in, in your flesh, feel hopeless and helpless. But I also know what it's like for God to take me further than I could ever take myself, and all I did was keep putting my little hand in his big hand. So see, I, I have that. I mean, I'll never forget. I'll never forget a, a, a lady just a while back. I think I mentioned it to you. She hears my story, and, and, and this, this person, I was getting a um, suit at that time for my um, oldest son's wedding just a couple months back, and, 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 and she's like, well, Pastor, I see that that worked for you, but what would you tell other people that aren't as strong as you? I said, what part of me ever said I was strong? I said, I was at my greatest level of weakness. I just found a new level of strength, and it wasn't me. Okay? There's a difference. Listen, if, if, if your greatest perseverance rests on you, you ain't getting far. I told her. I said, no, I just happened to serve a great God, and you can do, do it too. All I did was I just kept surrendering. Listen, sometimes all you can do is keep giving it and keep giving it and keep giving it over to God. I want you to hear this. While two situations or people are, are, are not exactly the same, there is always someone out there that can identify with your grief. Okay? You may be a one out of a million situation, but there is always people out there. And I want you to hear me. You need to find some of those people. I remember when I, when I got my first of three back surgeries, and, I, and I'm like, man, I searched online all over for, for God stories, and nobody, how many of you realize this? A lot of people, they don't write anything positive. All they do is go to the internet and write stuff negative. So all I found was sad stories, all the reasons why I'd never get better, all the reasons why surgeries don't work. The list goes on and on. And I said, God, if you'll, if you'll heal me and take me to a greater place, I want, I want to be that God story. That someone can, can hear and, 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 and they go, hey, he can identify with me. He, he, he knows where I'm at and, and I know now where he was at and where God brought him. Maybe he can do the same thing in my life. You bet he can. And all I did was I kept saying, God, you know, help me. Show me the next right step. Listen, even with Jesus, we all at times need some Jesus with skin. I'm going to say something to some of you that it needs to get in all your business when I say it. You need to invite more people into your business because your circle's too small. Okay? My wife will tell you, I pursue accountability. I pursue encouragement. I pursue whatever it is that I know that I need. Because how many of you know all you can do is be responsible for you? You can't be responsible for other people. Other people can't be responsible for you. you listen, that's the only thing God's asking you to do. Take the next right step as well as trust him with the next step. Even Martha and Mary, who knew Jesus personally and believed in him, they still needed support from others. I thought that it was Herndon Funeral Home here and Bryant Funeral Home in St. George that had the first ever, um, you know, come by and support the family. No, it was happening in, in the old days. Look at John 11, 18 through 19. It says, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, where Mary and Martha were. And many of the Jews had come to see Mary and Martha to comfort them concerning the loss of their brother. Man, that, that lets me know now. Like I said, Anthony was going to be all excited when I tell him, man, that's a God thing, visitation with the family. 
That's a God thing, providing an opportunity for support. By the way, I've, been, I've seen a trend um, over the last um, several years of my ministry. So this has been happening in the last five to six years. I've seen more and more and more people who, who lose a loved one, and then they don't want to have any kind of service. They don't want to do anything, period, okay? Listen, that's not going to make you better because grief, I want you to hear this part, you can't bury grief. You can't bury it. God can resurrect it, but you can't bury it. So you, you, you need to be realizing that not only you, but other people need the opportunity to grieve. You need to choose to grieve. It's okay to grieve. Some of you, you need to uh, see what you can do to get, be, come and join them the once a month um, grief group luncheon or something. Or you need to find some grief group somewhere else. You know, one thing I've been extremely proud with my mom on is my mom typically isn't somebody that, that um, again, pastor's wife, 45 plus years, um, she isn't a type person that's normally going to go to some support group or this or that. But when my dad passed away, she went to a lot of things. She, cho- she chose to go to support groups. She's chosen to, to, to be a part of a church fellowship that, that loves her where she's at. And, and listen, God will meet you with that. You hear me? He'll meet you with that. So sometimes I just think the enemy, the enemy says isolate. And God says, this ain't even in my notes, Lord Jesus, when he gives me stuff. God's saying I need to insulate. Okay? Some of you are trying to isolate, and really you need more insulation. Because if you don't insulate, and I'm going to say this heavy to you, because I watch it all the time. I'm watching people fall apart all the time. If you don't insulate because you're isolated, it's not going to go well. It's not going to go well. I, you know, something I look for in anybody's life, I say, hey, do they have one or two people in their life who they actually know give a rip? And I want you to know, I don't care if you, if you don't have anybody else, I promise you I care. I promise you there's other people in this place that care deeply. They don't even know you, but they love to get to know you. Maybe that's, maybe that's what you need to leave away from here today is, hey, God, who can you connect me with today that just adds one more layer of support? Last but not least, number five, celebrate the good stuff, even in the tough stuff. Celebrate the good stuff, even in the tough stuff. I think this is especially true as we try to be not just heal to this level, but now we're trying to go, okay, well, man, how do I I get even further along in this grief process? How do I make, how do I not dread the holidays? Um, How do I not dread this day or that day? Listen, holidays especially are difficult for many of us. Why? Because they resurrect the absence of someone that used to be at the table. Why? Because there's someone missing in our lives, and now that is revealed that, hey, you know what? Grandma used to be here. Sister used to be here. Brother used to be here. Whatever. My child used to be here. Listen, Satan loves to keep our minds focused on what we feel has been taken away instead of what God has given Oftentimes, we'll get laser-focused on the breaths that have been taken away instead of the next breath that he's given. Or how many of you would agree with me that when you lose a dear loved one, as much as it hurts, you would still rather have had them in your life sometime than no time? And you got to, listen, you got to think and ponder and intentionally count your blessings, name them one by one. There are plenty of times, if I really reach a low, I'm always grabbing a sheet. And I just go to writing, and it don't take me long to fill up the front and back with some good old praise. Listen, instead of just the the bad times, we need to ponder and reminisce about the good times. It's okay to be like, man, you remember that stupid joke? I just can only imagine. If some of you outlive me, I I just think they're going to go on and on. They'll say, let me tell you one more stupid thing he said. Let me tell you one more stupid thing he did. I can go ahead and, and, and pre-rehearse my funeral. I know that's going to happen. But you know what? Sometimes you need to laugh, don't you? Sometimes you need to laugh. Sometimes you need to, to remember that it wasn't always that way. Just as much. Listen to this part. You also have to remember it's not always going to be this way. Especially if they're in Christ and you're in Christ. Listen, we have to be, I want you to write this down. You have to be very intentional You have to be very intentional on praising God. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, believers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable and worthy of respect, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word, I want you to hear that part. 
Whatever is confirmed by God's word. Listen, if the word of God doesn't say it's true, it's not true. If the word of God doesn't say we, we should do it, then we probably shouldn't do it. It says whatever is pure and wholesome, whatever is lovely and brings peace, whatever is admirable and of good repute, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think continually on these things. And I love how the Amplified Bible puts it. It says center your mind on them and implant them in your heart. Two things you always got to keep your mind on. One, get, get your mind filtered through Christ and then also rest on praiseworthy truth. That's where the hope comes from. Listen, we can always celebrate no matter the season and no matter the season and source of our grief. Do you know God promises, especially in the darkest valley, to be with us? Psalm 23, 4 says, Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. Why? For you are close beside me. You're walking with me. You're, you're holding my hand. You're carrying me. Some of you don't even realize that you came in here today not because you had any strength left in you, but because you're on his shoulders. He got you up. He's taking you forward. It's not that God is absent in your life. If you didn't have God in your life, you wouldn't even have got here today. It says, your rod and your staff, they protect me and they comfort me. I close with this, these words to you. When it comes to your grief, Take time to grieve. Process it. Seek support through it. Trust God fully with it. Listen, the past, that's the what ifs. The present, the what now, and what will be is the future. Take one day at a time. Listen, when you're in deep grief, you don't need to look any further ahead than the next hour. And certainly no further than the today. Just keep, keep trusting God. Ask God to show you in his word to, to be a lamp to light your path. Celebrate the good times. Listen, just because you don't have any more time on this earth with them doesn't mean that you didn't have plenty to celebrate from the past together and plenty to celebrate of the future together in Christ. Look to Jesus for your true comfort, your healing, and your hope. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, God, Lord, I just pray, Lord, right now that you would just move upon these people. Lord, I'm, I'm trusting that you have been moving upon them. I pray that each person will take the next right step. Lord, I pray that, that the person who, who feels like they are, are, are the most grief-stricken, Lord, they would hear your love. They would feel your peace. Lord, they would know that there is hope, not in them, not in their circumstances, Lord, but in you. Lord, we as believers, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. God, help us to, to hold on to that hope. And Lord, to know that you're holding on to us, regardless of how we feel, think, or might find ourselves at this time. God, help us through our griefs, as well as use us to help others through their griefs. So in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. As you stand with us, this altar is open. I'm available here should you want me to pray with you or talk with you.